annual URIG annual meeting. We would we were supposed to and would have loved to have hosted RSC Chair Kathy Glenn in, in person in Munich and provided her with as much beer as she could handle. But unfortunately, we're all stuck in separate countries. But it's still our pleasure. And we are absolutely grateful that Kathy agreed in any case to come and talk to us. This year, we're all getting ready for 3R. We have tons of questions. Some we've already provided to Kathy. Kathy has agreed to answer some of the questions we didn't even think to ask. And I'm really appreciative. Kathy, over to you. Thanks, Ahava. Um, I'm going to kill my camera and share my screen. So you only get one thing at a time. So uh, let's make sure this works. Oh, please tell me this will work and I don't have to disconnect. All right, hadn't tried this. Okay, um, I'm going to have to quit this and come back so I can set the permissions so I can actually share my screen. I apologize. I will be right back. While we're waiting for Kathy, just a reminder, please keep yourself muted. Uh, cameras off. If you have questions, put them in the chat. The your executive committee will be monitoring the chat so that we can pass over your questions. At the end of the session, we'll ask you all to turn on your cameras so we can take a group photo. Anyone who's not interested in being in the group photo, just don't turn on your camera. Okay, I'm back and hopefully I've got my settings working now. All right. Okay, can every can somebody confirm that they can see my screen and you can hear yes, me? Yes, we, we can, can see your screen and okay. hear you. Yay! All right. So let's see. Um, this hopefully is working correctly now. So um, since I decided you did not want to see me while I was presenting and it would be a slightly distracting, I put in this uh, picture of me in my backyard garden taken a couple of days ago when I had a nice sunny day. So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak with you. Um, I'm talking to you this this morning, my time, um, from the Baltimore area in Maryland. And when I'm not chairing the RDA Steering Committee, which feels like a full-time job, I'm also head of Original and Special Collections Cataloging at the University of Maryland Libraries. I wanted to go over a couple of different topics today. One that, as Ahava suggested, you had asked about, and one that you didn't so much, um, but I think you still want to know. So the first and biggest one was how to approach aggregates and how to wrap your mind around this change in, in RDA and the beta toolkit. So there's information in the, the toolkit about aggregates. And you start with the ma manifestation. And I'm sorry, I'm pausing right now. I'm trying to get this display to work the way I want it to. <laughs> so much fun. Um, the, the manifestation, which embodies two or more expressions. And as you probably know, there are three types of aggregates. Uh, all the references here in the parentheses that you'll see throughout the presentation are to the beta toolkit. And, and I think you're familiar with these. There are this, the collection aggregate, which embodies two or more expressions of two or more independent works. The augmentation aggregate, which embodies two or more expressions of two or more works, where one is supplemented by others. And the parallel aggregate, which has two or more expressions of a single work. Now, you can have multiple aggregate types at once, which makes the whole thing even a little more complicated than you would like. 
an aggregate manifestation can be both a collection and an augmentation, such as this example, Benjamin Franklin's Poor Richard, the almanacs for the years 1733 to 1758. So each one of those almanacs separately, and then it includes a separate introduction and illustrations. So a bunch of stuff going on there. And then I even came up with a collection and augmentation and parallel, a compact disc example. This happens frequently in the things that I catalog. Uh, Aaron Kachaturian's Piano Concerto, published on the same CD as a Concerto Rhapsody for Piano and Orchestra by the same composer. And then the insert is program notes in German with an English translation. So as we already knew, aggregates aren't simple, and some of them decide that they can be more complicated than others. So the WEMI stack, work expression manifestation, an aggregate manifestation has at least three different WEMI stacks. There's the WEMI stack for the aggregate manifestation itself, the WEMI stack for the first individual expression in, in your aggregate manifestation, and then the second one, and the third one, and the fourth one, and so on. So it's not a simple thing to model either. You should all be familiar with this basic model for aggregates, which shows that the minimum three stacks that you would have, the aggregating work and expression on the right, and the individual works and expressions. And they all are focused there in the bottom in the aggregate manifestation. So what is an aggregating expression? Excuse me. Uh, it realizes the plan of the aggregating work to select and arrange expressions that are embodied by an aggregate. There is no whole part relationship here. The expressions that appear together in the aggregate manifestation are not components of the aggregating expression, and an aggregating expression does not inherit the characteristics of the intellectual or artistic content. So the aggregating expression does not have a language, and it does not have a content type. In fact, it has no intrinsic characteristics that are worth recording as attributes. This is a little alarming uh, because we kind of think about those things as being embodied in the aggregate. I'll get to in a little bit how that RDA is going to address that situation. What is an aggregating work then? Well, it's a plan to select and arrange two or more expressions or two or more works and embody them in a single manifestation. They're realized by one and only one aggregating expression. This is important. That means that we have a work expression or WE lock between the work and the expression. If an aggregating manifestation is reissued in any way, a change in the expressions that are aggregated means that you actually have a new aggregating expression in work. And again, there's no whole part relationship with the expressions that are aggregated. When you go to describe aggregates, there are many choices. Some are driven by policy statements and application profiles. Some will be driven by catalogers' judgment. Some will be driven more or less by what's in your collection and how important it is to bring out certain aspects of an aggregate. It is important to remember it's not necessary to record all of the expressions or work that are embodied by an aggregate. Different aggregates will definitely be described differently. For example, you could record the aggregating expression or aggregating work and omit the individual expressions or works, or you could record at least one of the individual expressions or works and omit the aggregating expression or work. This enables us to have re shortcut relationships. A shortcut is a relationship element that directly relates two RDA entities that are indirectly related through one or more intermediary entities. This allows these entities to be associated without recording any of the intermediate steps. And the information about the intermediary entity cannot be referred, sorry, inferred from the value of a shortcut element. If you don't record it, then you can't capture that specific information. So here's an example of a shortcut that has nothing to do with aggregates. Name of publisher is a shortcut for recording both publisher agent and name of agent. So we get to take one action instead of two. This is really useful for aggregates. 
because there are now 107 shortcut elements specific to aggregates in RDA. And when I say that, I mean the beta version, all focused on the manifestation. The contributor relationships are there, and they are the primary part of this. And here's some examples are contributor person of text, contributor corporate body to aggregate, and contributor family of moving image of. The definition and scope of these elements restrict them to aggregates. You'll find the phrase either that is embodied by an aggregate or a manifestation that is an aggregate in the definition and scope of every one of these contributor relationships. And then as we continued the analysis of aggregates, we realized that we needed to move the content relationships from expression to manifestation. And those are accessibility content, color content, illustrative content, sound content, and supplemental content. These have always been about supplemental content to manifestation. And I went back and even checked and the original RDA in 2012, the definition of illustrative content says it is content designed to illustrate the primary content of a resource. So way back when we were first thinking about RDA, we had this concept, but we didn't have the aggregates fully fleshed out at that point. So why do all of these contributor relationships exist anyway? Uh, surely the author is the same if the text stands alone in a monograph versus being published in a compilation. So going to one of my standby examples, Shakespeare's Hamlet is, is by Shakespeare, whether it's published alone or in an aggregate public entitled Four Great Tragedies. That's still true, but the relationships are different. The non-aggregate would have the relationship Shakespeare is author person of Hamlet, whereas the aggregate it would be Shakespeare is contributor person of text of Four Great Tragedies. The creator of the aggregate work is the agent who came up with the plan, not the creator of the content. And this is a really important consideration as we think about aggregates. Now, we often don't know who came up with the plan, and in some cases it may not be important who came up with the plan, and that's okay too. Obviously, what we want to record here is Shakespeare. That's how our users are going to find what, we, what is in our collection. So here's a real world example. Um, Thanks to Amazon for having a title page image I could capture. Uh, so Four Great Tragedies, Hamlet, Macbeth, Othello, and Romeo and Juliet by Shakespeare. The use of contributor shortcuts for aggregates will depend on cataloging decisions I make about this publication. What kind of description will be provided for these four plays? What about recording relationships to earlier publications of the same text? I'm sure many of you know Dover tends to reprint things. How important is it for me to identify the editor of the volume as T.N.R. Rogers? It may really depend on the nature of my collection and the nature of my users, how much detail I'm going to go into on all of that. So choices in describing an aggregate. From the, aggr from the guidance chapter on describing a manifestation, we have a section about describing a manifestation that embodies two or more expressions, and there are several options. Record information about one or more of the expressions that are embodied using a note. Record the, relate the manifestation to the aggregating expression using a relationship of expression manifested. Relate the manifestation separately to one or more of the expressions, not the aggregating expression, using that same relationship, expressed and manifested. Record the manifestation to the aggregating work using work manifested. Relate the manifestation separately to one or more of the works that are realized by expressions that are aggregated using work manifested. And relate the manifestation separately to one or more of the creators of one or more of the expressions by using contributor agent to aggregate. Lots of choices, and that will really depend, as I said, on the nature of the aggregate and the nature of your collection. We can also relate the manifestation to aspects of the content using those uh, content aggregate shortcuts of accessibility, color, illustration, sound, and supplementary content. So let's take a look at what I might do in describing the manifestation here. This is completely off the top of my head. It is not based on any application profile. Uh, your mileage may vary. But for the most part, 
the description of the manifestation is likely to be the same or very, very similar across institutions describing this because it's the relationships that will be different in the aggregates. So I decided to use these elements, title proper, other title information, statement of responsibility relating to title proper, place of publication, name of publisher, date of publication, carrier type, mode of issuance, extent, dimensions, and title of series. You might give more, you might give less, but generally I think we can all agree as to these being reasonable things to use to describe this particular manifestation. Then comes the fun part. You get to add the aggregate relationships based on, again, your judgment and your cataloging policy. One approach might be in this case to record the relationships to the individual expressions. And here I did this as an access point um, for the expression and decided to add the information that I had based on the information in the Dover publication about the earlier iteration of the text and how it might be identified. Three of the four plays were published in 1892 separately, but one, Othello, was published by Caxton Publishing and no date was available. So that's the variant in that access point there, why it doesn't have a date. If I do this, that may be sufficient to provide access and information to my users to these plays, and I may not decide that I need to do anything else. Or I could just record information about the works that are aggregated using a note, a uh, note of manifestation. I might also decide to omit this because it's already as other title information, but they are different elements, so there's no harm in duplicating those. In this case, I definitely would want to record Shakespeare as a contributor relationship, and I would do it as an authorized access point in this particular case in, in my own internal application profile. And I could record the editor as an aggregator person. It's not really an editor. I think this person was responsible for creating and aggregating work by selecting and arranging the expressions of other works. It's really important as we start trying to apply these new uh, relationships that we read the definitions and don't make assumptions based on the language of the label as to what they actually contain. So that was my decision. Your decision might be different. Other possibilities in, in making these aggregate relationships would be mixing and matching the data that I've showed you already, or possibly identifying the individual works instead of the individual expressions, or maybe identifying the aggregating expression rather than the aggregating work, or recording an access point for the work manifested instead of using an unstructured description. These are all options. Much flexibility. So I mentioned earlier the awkwardness of having these um, aggregates not have any, any content that's worth capturing. So we started looking at representative expression elements to see if that would solve this problem. The general definition of a representative expression is one that provides the values of specific elements used to identify a work and to distinguish that work from other works. And that quotes from the representative expressions guidance chapter in, in the toolkit. And it notes that any expression can be used as a representative expression. The use in extending it to aggregates, and later in that same chapter, an aggregating expression is not a representative expression because it does not contain the content of the expressions that are aggregated. So when we use representative expression elements with aggregates, they're actually coming from one or more of the expressions that are aggregated. This is an intellectual difference in the model but it's the same result for the end result for the users. We capture the data that people want to know and present it to them in ways that can be meaningful to them. So the representative expression elements for aggregates from one or more of the expressions are listed here. I'm not going to read them to you, but you can see that they range from aspect ratio and date of capture to place of capture and medium of performance and key and language. So there are quite a few of them here. They also can come from the manifestation for color content and sound content, or even accumulation of values from the expressions that have been aggregated, such as duration of the entire representative expression or the extent of the entire representative expression. Taken together, 
these three lists contain the same representative expression elements as the list applies to non-aggregates. So it's everything that you can use as a representative element for a, a non-aggregate can also be used the same way with aggregates. So back to the Shakespeare example, I can record the following representative expression elements if I want to. Um, content type would be text and language of representative expression would be English. These may be useful, especially if my collection contains translations of Shakespeare plays. All right, so that was real world example number one. Here's real world example number two. The collected poems of W.H. Auden is clearly an aggregate, but in my opinion anyway, it's one where the individual poems do not need to be captured in any way, not in a contents note, not certainly as individual works. The information from the editor's preface says that it in, the edition includes all the poems that Auden wished, wished to preserve in a text that represents his final revisions. And it goes on to a lengthy explanation of sources and variations and why they used the latest version of the poems and not the first version and why they omitted his early works and, and, and. So it's obviously collected poems, but it's certainly not complete. If your library has a strong Auden collection, this kind of variation and really capturing what poems are here versus what's somewhere else and how this brings together this, this um, previous edition and this previous edition, that could all be very, very important. But if you don't have a strong Auden collection, then those details may not be as critical for you. They, they're true, but that your users may not need them. So again, I would describe the manifestation using my application profile and applicable policy statements and capture very much the same things I did with the previous example. The title proper, the statement of responsibility, um, the editor, an edition statement, the year, the volumes, the pages. Again, you can see if it's 737 pages, I really don't even want a contents note for something that is relatively short poems. So then I would add the aggregate relationships as needed. And here are some possibilities. I could add contributor person of text as an authorized access point. I could add the work manifested as an authorized access point for work. I could add things relating to the work, such as the editor, uh, the content type, and the language, all as those last two as representative expressions. So that is real world example number two. Now there were questions that you all submitted that were also related to aggregates and I'm going to try to tackle those as well. So Paul Oster's book Talking to Strangers includes text and essays from 1967 to 2017. It was published as a book it's been translated into Danish, and because I can't speak Danish, I will just let you read the title there instead of embarrassing myself. But it's also been published as a book in Danish and as an audiobook. And the question was, how many works are there given this description? Because of that work expression lock, there are three works. There's the English text, there's the Danish text, and there's the Danish spoken word. There are definitely three works. But clearly those Danish versions are closely related. And we could use the work group concept to relate them. For the RDA glossary, a work group is a group of two or more works that have a common appellation assigned from a vocabulary encoding scheme. So we could assign a common identifier to each work in the group using one of the following, an appellation, an authorized access point, or an identifier. So one possibility would be to use Oster's name in whatever authorized form you have and the Danish title. That might be how you bring it together, especially if you are in a Danish language catalog where that is more important to you than perhaps the uh, tradition I would come from, which would use the English language title and then um, indicate that it was in Danish. But that's what, again, the actual elements for authorized access points will vary by community. could also use language version to relate the translation to the original. The language version is a work that is created by changing the language audience of a work, and it's a subtype of transformation by audience. 
Then another question was how to differentiate the different Danish versions at the work level. Well, they're going to need different appellations, uh, especially if you're using access points or anything else. Access points is still how I think as, as somebody trained in MARC. Uh, these would be determined by policy statements. The easiest way to distinguish these would be by the way, very way I did in the first slide I, when I talked about this, text versus spoken word. All right, since that's crystal clear to you now, I'll be moving on to real world example number four. There were questions about various augmentations of Walter Scott's Ivanhoe. The first was um, Ivanhoe retold by Meta Finderup. Danish version retold for children, and Scott is still considered the author. It includes illustrations, it's published in print, it's published both um, in print and online. Um, I got this information from OCLC, so that I felt like I was really talking about real publications, so I could wrap my head around examples. So if the print and the online are identical, then both manifestations will link to the same aggregating work and expression. It's going to be the cataloging agency's choice about how much detail to provide and which recording method to use when doing so about the various aspects of this aggregate. You could have the person doing the retelling just in a note, just in the statement of responsibility. You could create an access point. You could do any of, or all of those. What about the illustrator? Well, maybe the illustrations are in a note. Maybe you create an access point for the illustrations as a work. Maybe you do both. Maybe you don't want to identify the illustrations as a work, but you want to give the illustrator as a note. All of these are possible. The second example is retold by a different person, Seenstrup. There's the Danish version. Scott is, again, still considered to be the author. This includes illustrations by a different person. It was published in print in 1957 and 1971. Those are what I could easily identify. If the two print versions have the same content, then both manifestations, again, would link to the same aggregating work and expression. It will be the cataloging agency's choice about how much detail to provide and which recording method to use about the various aspects. And you'll see they're very similar questions. What about my reteller? Is a note, an access point? How am I going to deal with that? What about the illustrations? or maybe just the illustrator. I get to decide what works best for my collection and for my users. So the questions continued. How many works are there? Well, we have two separate aggregate manifestations, and so we have two separate works. How are we going to relate these so that people can find them meaningfully in our catalog? Possibly through a work appellation group for Scott's Ivanhoe, or maybe just through an access, access point for Scott's work as a whole. Why is the illustrator listed only at the manifestation level? As I started out with this presentation, this is actually where the aggregation takes place. It's a modeling decision that should not affect what data is recorded. It's up to our systems to make sense of where we record these elements. We need to utilize those descriptions to help meet our user needs of find, identify, select, obtain, and explore. Why isn't it possible to have a shortcut at the expression level? Well, it would be possible, but it's not the decision that we made. We considered this and decided that the manifestation expression shortcut works better for single manifestation cases, which we think are more frequent than having aggregate manifestations reissued or published in different formats. Certainly that happens as well, but we think that more aggregates happen in a, just a single situation. And the manifestation expression shortcut removes the need to record the aggregating expression in many cases, whereas if we used an expression to expression shortcut, we would have to identify the aggregating expression. And of course, we would still need to identify the aggregate manifestation because that's where everything comes together and is the physical thing that people would want to be able to check out of our collections. Another question, how should the authorized access points for these two works be constructed? As you've been hearing me say, the determination is going to be made by the community or cataloging agency via policy statements or application profiles using the general guidance instructions and options provided RDA. So it's your choice, and that's why you're not going to get 
effective, how do I do this training out of the RDA steering committee presentations? Because we are here to provide you the flexibility to get the outcomes that you need for your users. And as an international standard, we need to be flexible. We know we can't get everyone to agree on everything. So there are many choices, and what you currently do is already likely supported in the beta toolkit. One of our commitments in going through 3R process was to not remove anything that was still valid with LRM from the beta toolkit. It might not be the preferred way to do it anymore. It might not be a forward way of doing something, forward-looking way at this point, but it's still available to you. And frankly, a good deal of it will be sort of mainstream. You just need to figure out where it is, and chances are what you already do is currently supported. So how should the authorized access point for the illustrations be constructed? Well, the same answer is above, local decisions supported by RDA. But as I mentioned in both of these examples, identifying the illustrations as a separate work is not required. If your collection focuses on artwork by one of the illustrators, then obviously you're going to have a different decision than if you have a collection of books where you're focused more on the text and isn't it nice that they have pictures. We also had questions, okay, now clearly everything is clear to you about aggregates. Um, RDA in our systems, questions came from you. How do you see the concrete implementation of entity cataloging allowed by LRM and RDA? Frankly, I think for most of us, it's going to be a slow transition from MARC-based to linked database records. And I must say, I you need to understand I'm coming from a North American perspective. Um, I'm not a, as aware of projects and initiatives in Europe some of you may be aware of something that will allow you to move more quickly from our more traditional, older school-based things to something new and exciting. Do I know about countries or communities that are working on next generation cataloging based on LRM and 3R RDA entities? I'm not aware of anything that's ready for production, but I know that RIMP4, RDA in many, many metadata formats, fourth version, is a good proof of concept. And I know that some smaller collections have used uh, the earlier version of RIMP to catalog and create linked data based uh, records, if you will, for their collection. And finally, do I have any advice on how to foster ILS developments toward entity cataloging? Boy, if only I could answer that question coherently. Uh, it is a classic chicken and egg problem. The vendors really don't want to move until there's demand. We don't want to move until the vendors will support it. So what's really important, I think, then, is for all of us in various iterations and abilities and interactions to engage with our vendors and tell them what we want. They are interested in supporting our needs, but they need to know that there's a critical demand for what we're asking for. So hearing it from multiple sources in multiple places over a longer period of time, I think, would be very helpful. Another question that's related to all of this, with so many choices, which I've emphasized already, about how to describe the same manifestation and the relationships associated with it, how can data created by our different cataloging agencies interoperate? Well, first and foremost, if you want it to interoperate with RDA, you're going to need to use the RDA elements as defined, because the underlying semantics of the elements are consistent. This then can be used to automate integration and interoperability regardless of which operations options are applied. And this will hold true for all kinds of resources, static works, diachronic works, aggregate works, various carrier types, everything. And a reminder that it's not necessary to invoke the entire model in a single description. You saw that with all of my examples. You don't have to capture every data element. You capture the data elements that are important to you and to your users. So for more information about RDA content elements, we have a paper that was discussed at the October 2019 RSC meeting in Santiago, and it's available in the new RSC documents 2019 link uh, page on our website. There's also a follow-up because it was complicated, and that was discussed at the January 2020 RSC meeting, uh, but it was developed in 2019, so it's still under the 2019 
new RSC documents. And then the latest work that we've done on representative expressions of an aggregating work, the paper was discussed in the April 2020 RSC meeting and is linked on the 2020 page. Now I can see that there's some chat. Let me open that and see if there's anything I can answer before I go on to the next section. So I hope um, Rita's question about many options, high flexibility, but what about matching metadata records from different communities? I hope that maybe that last uh, description helped and Gordon has an answer for that too. Can, then can the policy guidelines for building AAPs be considered an SES? Yes, um, we are expecting policy, uh, st string encoding schemes, which I'm gonna talk about next, um, to be community driven and um, will be definitely string encoding schemes. So thank you for your questions. I, I will then move on to my next topic, which as promised is string encoding schemes. I developed this content for a presentation I'm giving in two days for the um, Program for Cooperative Cataloging Operations Committee and when I asked Gordon to review it, he said, you should share that with Eurig. So I've made a few slight changes, but you actually get a preview of something that I'm going to be giving in two days. So what is a string encoding scheme or SES? The RDA glossary gives this definition, a set of string values and an associated set of rules that describe a mapping between that set of strings and the value of an element. So let's take a look at what these mean. A set of string values is textual character string. An associated set of rules is instructions. A mapping is matching between that set of strings and the value of an element would be a representation of that element. And I just called this out because these are not, these are more programming kind of language than cataloger language. It just takes a little bit of time for catalogers to get their heads into the new way things are phrased, but it does make perfect sense if you spend a little bit of time. So in more traditional cataloging terms, an SES is about how to construct an access point, including questions like what information to record, in what order, and with what punctuation. It also includes things about how to construct a statement about an edition, series, or imprint, very much like the ISBD punctuation, uh, sorry, publication statement. These decisions may vary by cataloging tradition or practice, or maybe not. SESs in RDA, a search in the beta toolkit right now on string encoding scheme will return 124 results, including edition statement, publication statement, and those kinds of statements, plus access points, authorized access points, variant access points, and most elements that are associated with Nomen, because Nomen, of course, has to do with string encoding schemes. SESs may vary by agency. All of these are preferred forms in VIA for Dr. Seuss for at least one cataloging agency. And the changes are whether doctor is first or last, whether you indicate a pseudonym, how, if you present the dates, how you present the dates, whether you give the name of the, 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 the real name of the author, all sorts of things. These are all valid. And that meant that RDA has had a choice. Do we try to define all of these and their variants or what? Because as an international standard, what is the best way to do this? We could hard code the SESs in the instructions, adding each variant in its own option box and adding to those as more communities join the RDA community and say, oh, but that's not how we do it. We need our string encoding scheme to be put in here too. Another approach would be to move the content out of the element pages and provide access through multiple links or expandable boxes. So the content would still be on the page or to move the SES content entirely out of the element pages to policy statements and have them displayed that way. And I have mock-ups of each of these options, but each approach requires that the community involved determine the appropriate SES for each situation and then create policy statements that either identify the designated option or contain the actual instructions. So approach number one, and I, I did not go back and update this to show anything other than LCPCC statements. So just, you can pretend it says whatever you want it to say there. The hard coding thing here would be a box that says string encoding scheme, 
do this, blah, 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 blah. Then another one that says string coding scheme, do this, blah, 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 blah. And in the right rail where the policy statements appear, your policy statement would say, apply this option, do not apply this option. And there would be as many of these gray boxes with string encoding schemes as there were variations about how to do that by whatever community using RDA. Another approach would be to provide information about SESs through links. So you have a condition box and then you have an option, do this, option, do this. Instead of having the full content and instruction in the box, the option box would just simply say that there is a string encoding scheme and an example that tells you how to do it, value one, value two, with whatever punctuation is needed. And then you could see that each option would need to have an either apply or do not apply. So in my case, if I were applying the LCPCC statements here, I would have to get down to the third option before I got to the one that I needed to plot. Approach number three is what we actually ended up with, to move SES instructions to policy statements. This image is from a current page in the toolkit that is part of what we were able to get out as a test data in the April release. And the content is still very much sample uh, both and the formatting is also a sample but you can see the concept here being different so there's an option box that says do the, you know treat the following as a larger jurisdiction blah 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 the policy statement then says here's what in this particular case the place is within a human settlement and that means you're going to do da 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 and then that again this play displays in context in the toolkit So as I said, we, we decided on this final option because it minimizes the proliferation of options on element pages and it clearly presents the community SES decision to catalogers in the context of an element page. If I've picked the British Library policy statements to display, I will not automatically see the LCPCC PSs. That I will, I will have access to them because they're in the toolkit, but if that's what I'm using, that's what displays and I don't see the clutter from cataloging agencies and cataloging policies that are not applicable to my situation. On the back end, the reuse of current RDA instructions is supported by the toolkit's content management system and so that helps the people who are working to create these, these uh, SESs in a community area. It does mean the decisions and maintenance is left up to the communities but frankly that was going to be in some case true no matter what we did. And if your preference is to continue practices from the original toolkit, you don't need to rethink how to do it. The question is how to encode that information in the toolkit, but you don't have to come up with a brand new, oh, I need to know how to construct an access point for a corporate body with a sub body and blah, blah, blah. So you could use ISBD and Appendix E information. You could use whatever else is applicable in your community. And what's really important here is if you are using linked data, then string encoding schemes are really irrelevant. Um, these, this really is something about constructing data for human consumption as opposed to linked data. So I alluded to community vocabularies a minute ago. These are very closely related to string encoding schemes. These community vocabulary concept has obviously been prompted by increased internationalization. We know that the legacy instructions and guidance in RDA that were largely in touch from ACR2 have an Anglo-American focus. And this includes the um, former appendices, if you will, of abbreviations and symbols, additional instructions on names of persons, capitalization, initial articles in terms of rank. We've been working on this for some time. We already lo relocated some content from RDA instructions to a separate section under resources, or as you may be more familiar right now, tools in the original toolkit. Books of the Bible we moved out in 2016 in recognition that not everyone across the globe wants to define books of the Bible in terms of the King James Version. And terms for medium of performance, which were incomplete anyway, um, were moved out of the music instructions in 2018. It's all about supporting different choices. Not everyone wants to conform to Anglo-American practices. 
communities may wish to support interoperability, interoperability with their own legacy data as well. And indeed, cataloging communities' preferences may change over time. One question I have for the PCC group on the equivalent slide here is, do you still want to be doing abbreviations the way you have been since AACR1? RDA needs to support development, maintenance, and publication of local vocabularies as part of the toolkit, and this is a long-recognized need. It was first identified in 2015 as a good solution to support use of local terms for a particular vocabulary that would not be useful across the world. All of this is still under development, and you should expect to see further changes through 2020. So what are the characteristics of community vocabularies? Well, they need to be compliant with RDA and LRM. That's not surprising. That's the message you're going to hear from the RDA steering committee. They're associated with the processing of strings in, in string encoding schemes. They could be community-specific vocabulary encoding schemes that don't necessarily conform to a full VES, but are just terms your community needs. Those concepts may lack definitions, scope notes, IRIs, or notations, although we would hope you would provide something so your users would know what it is that they are supposed to use and how to use it. But the coverage can be incomplete. And our idea is that these community vocabularies would only be used by specific RDA communities as opposed to globally. So they might cover a limited number of languages or scripts. We do expect them to be maintained by experts in whatever they are about, languages, scripts, cultures. And again, if you're continuing existing practices, no intellectual work in terms of the decisions to be made would be needed. And most importantly, the community vocabularies will not require transla translation in every toolkit language. They are for a specific community. If that community is bilingual, or trilingual or whatever, then perhaps you would need to translate them. But the, the obligation to translate this is not on the translation teams for the toolkit. It would just be for the community that needs it. So this is a transition in process. Here's a screenshot of what the resources tab looked like in the beta toolkit in February 2020 versus what it looks like now. And you can see we've added this community vocabularies and collapsed a few other things. This means that they're new pop-outs. We are not taking anything away right now. Um, one of my big pushes um, since I've been on the RSC is we can't remove instructions that people are finding useful. We can move them, but we can't remove them. Um, so some things will ultimately get re removed from RDA proper and put in these community vocabularies, but we didn't want to zap them entirely and have people trying to use RDA say, but, but that most important thing I need isn't there anymore. So we have um, pop-outs for various things, names of persons, capitalization, initial articles, and community vocabularies. You can see this is where some of those things went, abbreviations, terms of rank, and so forth. We'll take a closer look on, on each of these. So this draft content for community vocabularies has been migrated from existing toolkit instructions. If abbreviations aren't important to you, you can ignore this. The, there's a new pop-out for Books of the Bible because we relocated it. So this is actually a second pop-out, a pop-out within a pop-out. For terms of rank, this obviously is very incomplete if there are only four sets of instructions here, we could add more. Um, four different communities could add their own as they need to identify them. In terms for collective titles, this may look familiar to you. Um, we decided this really didn't belong in RDA proper. These are very, obviously, very English-centric terms. And there's a move away toward using collective titles, conventional collective titles, in, in a lot of, as we start thinking about how to use RDA, there's more communities that are wondering, do we even need these? So they're a community vocabulary. Your community can choose to use them. Um, if you're not an English-based community and you like these, you can translate this and you can develop and maintain this content. Terms for gender. Um, this used to be something that was in the toolkit and then we decided it created more problems than it solved ultimately. 
Uh, but for communities that want to record gender and want to maintain a vocabulary, this could happen here. Terms for medium of performance, I suspect over time this one is going to go away because as I mentioned it was incomplete in the first place, but because we did not want to remove instructions from RDA that some people might still be using. It's here and it's still available. This is quite extensive, um, that's why you see the ellipses at the end of the slide. I just put on what this screen should capture what would fit. Now still to be determined about all of this is the final terminology. As I've been using the phrase community vocabularies, it is a working term. Another thing would be how to identify which community uses which content and how to present that seamlessly to catalogers who use the toolkit. How are we going to share that content? For example, if the British Library follows the LCPCC decisions in a particular area, does that need to be duplicated or can they point to it or otherwise share it? And if they are sharing content and one of them decides to make a different decision, how is that communicated to the agency that is sharing it? What happens if they make a decision that the other agency doesn't like? This all has to be worked out. We also want to make sure that it's interoperable with policy statements, application profiles, and user-created documentation. But exactly how that's going to work is, is yet to be resolved. And finally, the location and display in the toolkit is not final. What you've seen off the resources tab is what we're working on now, but the potential for proliferation of community vocabularies indicates that we may need to consider alternatives. The good news is with the way we have the data structured in the back end and the content management system, that should be able to be done pretty easily, moving it around and seeing what works best. So as with the aggregates, there's more information in papers that have been published on the RSC website. There's community vocabularies in the RDA toolkit, which was discussed at the April 2020 asynchronous meeting, the RSC. And there's string encoding schemes in RDA toolkit, which was discussed in January 2020. And not only is that paper available, but also the summary of the RSC discussion and decisions coming out of that meeting are available. That's not true yet for the community vocabularies because we have not completed our minutes from that. So that's what I have for you today. And I'd be happy to take your questions. And I don't know how you want to manage questions. <laughs> I have a question or more or less a statement, Casey. Renata is speaking. Go ahead, Renata. Hi. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much, Casey, for all these explanations. Um, the examples, um, we need so much examples as possible. That's clear. We talked about this yesterday. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the aggregates and even the new concept of diachronic works will be the hardest thing we are confronting with in the near future. And so every help is welcome. Um, I can say from the discussion as well as summarized from yesterday that we appreciate that EURIC members appreciate very much the approach towards internationalization. Um, because, um, and EURIC will support this in any way. This is in our opinion, I think a really, really good approach and um, we are very happy that the RSC and the board took this on their plans and um, there is a certain, this driven now to fulfill this and we are very happy about this and we will support this in any way. What rests in European communities, I think, are the concerns about the community, uh, the community adaption work. Um, which I have to admit is, is not trivial. There will be much work for us to do to break um, the actual or the new um, RDA toolkit for daily work in cataloging. I think you know this, we talked about this so often, but that's where we are confronted and I think some of our members feel a bit helpless um, or a bit worried about how to do this because I think I can speak only for the German speaking community, but perhaps it's uh, more or less the same in many other communities. When we started to adopt an international standard, 
RDA. We hope to save resources to have data exchange very explicitly. Um, and now there are so many concerns that we have to give this up when there will be so many community um, adaption work, community regulations, policy statements, different application profiles. And, you know, we have in Europe, we have so many and so different and heterogeneous communities. And there will be a very heterogeneous RDA landscape in Europe, let's say. Um, so these are our concerns. Um, and Jurek is willing, so we talked about this very much in um, connection with the application profiles. Um, we are hoping that there will be a link, a connection for the communities worldwide, that data exchange will work. Um, and we fear, and that's what we are a bit feeling now in our communities, um, that so many of our catalogers are saying, um, why to use the toolkit if I, I would like to have a manual or very explicitly work our training materials, that's enough for me. And we now have many concerns in our communities to lose this link um, as, a, as a whole RDA community, let's say. But I ask all my colleagues here in Europe, Euric members, um, to raise your concerns and your questions. But that's what I heard so much all around in Europe. Yeah, and, and we've definitely been hearing that as well. Uh, I think what's important is remembering that we're recording data elements. We can all agree, I, I hope, or in most cases can agree on to what the title proper is or what the statement of responsibility is, yeah. what the frequency of a serial is. Um, and then as, as long as we've labeled our data appropriately, then it can be exchanged and understood by others who understand our data. And it is, it's what I think for me is the hardest is this transition from constantly thinking in Mark 21 and trying to see how RDA works in Mark 21, spoiler alert, not really well, and how it might work in linked data, which I don't know a lot about. So it's, there's all sorts of challenges in being in this transitional time. One thing that I do tell folks when they start being concerned about how many RDA elements there are is I point to how many Mark 21 elements there are and Mark 21 values and how many of those as a music cataloger I do not use. And the same thing applies to the RDA elements. As a music cataloger, I would be surprised if I ever used the map coordinates uh, for something that I'm cataloging. So we've adjusted in the past to our systems that we're just very, very familiar with in being able to have data elements we don't use or options that vary by country and yet we can still, our cataloging community, and we can still exchange our data. Um, OCLC, I found those Danish examples I found were not in English. Uh, they were in the, the language of the catalog was Danish. I had to remember to change my settings and connection to get those records. And if I were to catalog one of those for my own institution, I could use the basis of the cataloging done in, in Denmark as the as the basis of my catalog and change just a few things like the terms that I use for the pagination and, and the terms that I use for the subject headings. So I think maybe it's just because it's all unfamiliar and because we're working with a beta toolkit, one of the things that I found really helpful was with the April release to see how the policy statements and this decision about string encoding schemes would actually look in a real environment, as opposed to something that I had to just try to envision in my own head. We are continuing to develop the toolkit and we want all these things to be integrated into the toolkit so that I as a cataloger can look in one place and see what I need to see. And we have the potential of making quote unquote views of the toolkit that might only deliver to me as a cataloger, at least as a primary thing, what I need and not all the noise of the things that I don't need. So the, the benefits and challenges of releasing a beta product for review is that it's not complete and it's easy for people to then 
find things to criticize because it's not complete. We know it's not complete. We're working on it. It's getting better. Thank you, Casey. I'll take it. This is a hop. I'll take advantage of having the microphone not to type in. I understand how the data is interoperable in terms of we all use the same family group of elements. We all will use same encoding. What concerns me about all of the choices, particularly if communities can't necessarily see each other's policy statements and application profiles. I'm assuming not every community will be represented in the toolkit is what happens now with OCLC is I will get an email from a cataloger in Pennsylvania saying I've got a book that has illustrations your record doesn't have. I don't know if I have what you've got. And I'm kind of afraid that with the aggregates and all the choices, that sort of concern will proliferate because I may choose not to put in the illustrations and then they look at their book and don't know if the record they found in OCLC is the same thing because they don't know what my choices were. So is there gonna be a way to see all of everyone's choices? And if not, how do we help make people understand that they're looking at the same thing we were looking at. Yeah, that's a really interesting question about the application profiles and policy statements. We're certainly willing to support having, and Jamie can always, <laughs> Jamie can always jump in if I say something crazy. Um, we're interested in having policy statements and application profiles incorporated into the toolkit. Um, the ones that are, you definitely could, uh, look at them. So I, as a North American cataloger, when I use RDA, I'm going to say, I want to see the LCPCC policy statements, but anybody else's policy statements will be available to me, not as the, in the same level of integration, but they will be available. And I hope people would be willing to share their application profiles, whether that's in the toolkit or external to the toolkit. So that might help. Um, having a collection of those and having people to to be able to consult, but there will always be questions. And but as as, Hava, as you say, we deal with this right now. Um, a public library catalog. Well, I had this situation. I love how I interrupt myself. Uh, my first professional job was at an archive. It was the Arnold Schoenberg Institute, and it essentially owned everything Schoenberg had in his possession when he died. Obviously, Schoenberg's influence and the access we created for him and everything was the be all and end all of that collection. And we created access points if he bound the thing, if he had a pen and he scribbled in the thing, you name it. And we also, um, when we cataloged sound recordings, not only did we provide an access point for the person who wrote the program notes, we wrote we could access point for the person who translated the program notes. Incredible depth of description levels because it was an archive and it was really, really important. But when, that was a one year grant funded position and then I went and was a music cataloger at the institution but not in that same organization and I would encounter Schoenberg records and at that point we were creating individual records for our local catalog and I would I would tell like, I know this is really good cataloging, but I don't need this access point, and I don't need this access point, and I don't need this description. <laughs> and so, and then I can imagine what, what would happen if a public library even then had taken my, my slim down record and what they would really need. So we've been dealing with this all along, and the level of description is that's needed is really, really depends on the collection involved. And maybe we have to get a little less hung up on perfection. I hate to say that, I'm a cataloger. Um, and more on data exchange. If we're, and I see some of the, the chat has talked about identif identifiers will help with some of this, but not everything has an identifier. Um, a few years ago in RSC meetings, we were talking about, well, what if you just whipped out your iPhone or other 
device and took a picture of your, your title page and then had that attached to your record in some way, or that's really a lot like a manifestation statement, just having an image, that, that could help too. Um, I, more and more, uh, when I do these presentations, I'm able to get images of title pages off of the internet, um, and maybe that helps with that kind of, is this the same thing question. Anyone else have any questions? Ah, okay, new, new questions coming up, Kathy. Yes, I see. Okay, so do I have suggestions for an action with ILS vendors, especially for the open source community of Koha developers? I am uh, sadly not familiar. I know uh, that Koha exists, but after that, not a whole lot. Um, I think what I would really, what I personally would like to talk to vendors about would be their support of linked data overall and not exclusively BibFrame. And the, the, what I hear from vendors more is that, oh, we're moving to BibFrame. And BibFrame, it's, I would think that if a system can support BibFrame, it should be able to support other linked data applications as well. And I do know that work is going on at OCLC to see if they can start looking at linked data models that would support a variety of linked data, not, ex, not just RDA, not just schema.org, not just BibFrame. So I would, I would challenge our vendors to think more broadly would be one thing. Um, and then I, the thing, the thing that worries me about vendors is sometimes they, they get things a little simple um, or the developers don't quite know what they're talking about. And this comes from a um, three and a half decade career where I've seen vendors say, oh, well, that's easy. I'm like, no, no, it's not. Don't, don't think it's easy. Um, so dialogue with the vendors, tell them what you need. And, and work with them and, and think big. I, I would say that would sort of be the best I could offer you right now. So hope, Stefano, that that helped. Um, Rita says, I cannot imagine that catalog or study policy statements of other communities to understand some records and their specifics or to avoid duplicates. And what if we're talking about duplicate control by machines? Right, I, there are, people who want to go the extra mile and make sure they're doing something absolutely correct. And there, there are people who can draw a line and say good enough is good enough. And then there's all the data that we ingest by machine that we don't get to manipulate in any way or just in minor ways. So it is part of a, I think we're really at a time of transition. There's, I because I do this work, I like to think that there's still a role for beautifully crafted original cataloging records. But um, right now, due to the COVID-19 crisis, my campus is closed and my dean is trying to continue to tell the campus how wonderful the libraries are and how we're continuing to support student education. And she wants to give numbers and like how many e-resources have been activated and made available to our users? Well, I can tell you that the people doing original cataloging are not doing much of that. If we have an ability to um, activate an entire collection online and make a two or 3,000 titles instantly available to our users in, in you know, half an hour versus how much one of my whole department can catalog in half an hour, we're not that important to that messaging right now. It's not that what we do is not important. It's not that there's not a, a future for us in doing that work, but we're, we're in an environment where we have to be able to get data out to our users, and some of that is going to be under our control, and some of it is largely going to be ingested from other people. So, sorry, you got a little bit of my pain there at the moment. No, please, we're, we're still relevant. I see Gordon has an answer to Stefano. Um, RSC publishes the RDA element sets under an open license that allows commercial reuse. So ask Koha and other developers to consider using the RDA elements. We heard that at least one Koha support community has used the RDA vocabularies to populate pick lists. So yes, please, please do let your vendors know that this RDA is available as linked data. I think a lot of them forget that.
Anyone else have any questions for Kathy? Okay, yes, we can give you all the time you need, Bernard. <laughs> if you'd like, you can unmute yourself instead of typing it in. Okay, thank you. I can see why Bernhard decided he wanted to just keep typing. What's the point in cranking up the abstraction for aggregate and serial modeling when it's highly unlikely these concepts will ever be displayed to users? Your presentation also included an aside that aggregate expressions actually have no characteristics worth recording, which is also in an RSC discussion paper. Put another way, why bother with theory when the specifics are just there for logical consistency and not practical application? Well, I'd say first of all, we need to have a model. And the model makes assumptions and models are imperfect. This is my this is my usual spiel on models. But we need the model. We need to understand what we're doing and we need to understand the relationships. Once we have the model, we can decide what is important in the model, where we can make shortcuts and make sure we haven't broken the semantics. And it's really about the data, not necessarily about what we decide to do with our users. If we craft good data, it can be used in this way and it's flexible for use in the future. If we create dumbed down data, there's not a lot we can do with it. I don't know how many of you interact with Dublin Core records, but they're pretty minimal compared to the Mark 21 records that I'm most familiar with. We can map Dublin Core records into MARC and make them interoperate, but the data has been dumbed down. I just know it's a creator. I don't know it, what kind of creator. I don't know if it's a person or a corporate body and so forth. So the reasons behind having the detailed model is that we can identif clearly identify for our use and for our future reuse what we're talking about. Hi, it's, um, this is Deanna White from the International uh, ISSN Center. Uh, I am uh, leading the project to start the revision of the ISSN manual. And I must say that just trying to incorporate uh, consistency with the LRM model as well as RDA uh, is proving somewhat of a challenge just to think how to write instructions for our 90 different national centers on how to create serial records. Um, and when I look at your presentation descri describing aggregates, I really feel quite lost about how, how I'm going to write instructions that fit and that will be easily understood by a very mixed group um, that have um, all different levels. Uh, some of our member countries don't even really know much about MARC records. They're creating very basic records. Um, right. It's more of a, a comment um, just uh, rather than a question, but I don't, I don't know what your, your thoughts are on that. Right. Well, you're working with what I think is the maybe the most difficult ever kind of publication we deal with. In fact, I've often said that if system designers would deal with serials first and music second, they would handle everything else. Um, so aggregates are even more complicated once you throw in the diachronic aspect, which of course is what the ISSN folks deal with the most. It's, it's, for me, it's really breaking these things down into their pieces and identifying what's most important. Um, it was really helpful for me to put together this presentation for you on aggregates because it forced me to grapple with some of the issues and some of the options that are available. The ultimate flexibility, which is great 
in a lot of cases and then horrifying in maybe in your case because you need to you need to come up with something that makes sense and not just for a single community up in terms of language but a single community in terms of format um, but yeah it's it's tough you need to to try to break down and identify what the most important pieces are um, I would say we we would be happy to work with you if you have particular questions please let the RSC know we can see if we can point you in the right direction or connect you with people who might be able to help yeah I will definitely take you up on that offer thank you Um, we have a question about why focus so much on the model when we have IFLA LRM. If something is missing, why not train, try to change IFLA LRM? So the RSC considers um, RDA to be fully compliant with IFLA LRM, period. If something is missing, why not try to change IFLA LRM? IFLA LRM was designed so that it could be expanded on by standards that would actually put it into practice. It's intentionally designed to be a framework for which further refinements can be made. We consider the um, refinements in RDA to be fully compliant with LRM. It would then be up at the international level for someone to take it back to the, the IFLA LRM folk who are developing and modifying it and see if any of our extensions would be worth adding to the international model at that level. Uh, as you probably know, I currently don't participate in the IFLA level. I know some of you do and are heavily involved and so you could correct me if I've said anything wrong. but. The intention of LRM was to be a high-level model and then have refinements at um, practical level. It's one of the reasons we kept the, um, the breakout that RDA already had with corporate body and family, whereas LRM has collective agent only. Um, that was, it is compatible with LRM and we also did not want to break anything that people were using already, so it was, we considered it to be compatible. Ronnie asks, yes, Gordon, go ahead. Sorry to say something, uh, because I am one of these uh, IFLA people. Um, aggregates. Um, I think most of the people on this call know that IFLA had a working group on aggregates, which reported some, I don't know, seven or eight years ago. Uh, and in that report, uh, there was so much dissension on the theory and modeling of aggregates uh, that the report itself said, do not implement this. The report said, wait until the consolidation of the functional requirements family of models. RDA took that advice on board. So uh, I have to say also that RDA, uh, because it was in a status quo position, necessarily had to follow on with what was ever, whatever was in RDA from AACR2 in the treatment of aggregates at the time. So essentially, RDA has not amended or in any sense modernized its treatment of aggregates uh, since the Anglo-American cataloging rules days, which is now well over 20 years ago. So to ask whether we can uh, change the, the LRM is to say, well, what happened? Because the LRM re-examined the working group on aggregates report and decided uh, to go with the main report. So it would appear to me that a whole community of international experts has spent the past 10 years coming up with this theory. Uh, I uh, am not going to query that. I am one of those experts and I happen to agree with the conclusion. So if you wish to change the library reference model, uh, then I suggest you go off and do so, uh, attempt to, but I don't think you're going to get very far. The LRM is what it is. It's the result of 15 years of theoretical thinking 
uh, applied to global practical application of cataloging. And I think that's probably the best that you can do. So my answer is live with it, work around it. Uh, I also have to say that quite a lot of the, the why can't we keep it simple uh, and some of the things that have, have been mentioned already are very, very, very focused on traditional print publications. I doubt very much whether this kind of consensus that is emerging here uh, about whether something is useful or complicated uh, actually only applies to, to print materials. I think there's far more divergence in both uh, thinking and application as soon as you move out of the traditional print world. That's my two cents worth. Well, and as I was seeing some correspondence from a colleague, what we catalog is complicated. Um, some of you, I think, probably saw my presentation uh, to IFLA, I can't now remember, I, I did two presentations last year where I, I walked through trying to catalog a book. And in at least one of them, I was asked to catalog a, a simple book. And my first caveat was there was no such thing. Uh, I went through the stacks at work to try to find a reasonable example for one of these. And I think I had to reject 10 or 15 things before I found something that I thought was simple enough to qualify as being a simple book. Uh, these things, as I was looking for examples for this presentation, I just wandered around my house because I am in isolation here in Maryland. Um, we think we're now at safer at home status. And so I don't have a, a broad collection of things to, to go looking for. It was not difficult to find aggregates in my collection. Here's this thing with illustrations. Here's this thing with an index. Here's this thing with um, two memoirs and an index. Here's this thing with a, that, um, that crazy Poor Richard's Almanac example that I used earlier in my slides. That is actually in my collection and was apparently a free book given to my parents. So I should have just rejected it. It was complicated. Um, it wasn't hard to find aggregates. In fact, it's hard not to find aggregates. Our stuff is complicated. And if we want to describe it accurately and have it that be useful to our, our users, then we have to have something that can handle that. Um, sort of back to Dublin Core, were we happy with those 15 elements? I personally never was. Uh, but then I'm an original cataloger by heart. So that's, that's where I come from. Uh, Rania had a couple of questions. I think it would take much time for of the communities to digest all the changes and what do we think as many communities are still facing some problems in understanding the old toolkit. Right, um, it's a transition. It's a, for many of us coming out of the Anglo-American tradition, um, adjusting to the original toolkit was a challenge. And that we had a great advantage of that over many of you who were not coming out of an Anglo-American tradition where it was maybe even more strange. Uh, it's a necessary change. Um, as Gordon was indicating, the, the original toolkit is focused, the way it just presents itself, it, it presents a, an implied workflow. It's not complete. There were all those placeholder chapters for things that we expected would be happening at the international level with modeling and Ferber and FRAD and so forth that didn't happen. And it was time, it was time from a design standpoint for the toolkit. It was the time with LRM changing, uh, coming into existence actually, for us to make some significant changes. These changes are, they're disruptive. There's no doubt about that. But at the same time, we can't just stay where we were. The reason that RDA exists is because AACR3 was not considered viable. And AACR3 was considered that something that needed to happen because AACR2 wasn't viable. The nature of what we collect has changed substantially in the time that I've been a cataloger. Um, Print-based to electronic resource-based is a major one. So we need to keep being flexible and evolving. There is, you know, we can't just stick our heads in the sand and hope that 
things won't change around us. It's, it's all part of dealing with the ever-changing situation we have. Rita asks, there are a lot of concerns in URIG about the language of the beta toolkit that is far from natural language and sometimes hard to understand. Are there any plans or activities in RSC to improve that in the future? Is it a goal that many people use and understand RDA in the toolkit or is it only made for some elite specialists developing policies and APs? There have been a lot of changes to the toolkit wording and it it's because we don't really have a cataloging manual anymore. It was easy to pick up our earlier cataloging codes, and here I really can only speak about ACR2, but I assume it was true for others, that I could pick this up and learn how to catalog, and it was, it should be straightforward, and I knew what to do, and I knew when to do it, and I knew what order things went in, and I knew what supplements to ACR2 I should consult to get the perfectly crafted record. That's not what we have now. And it's not what we have because, again, of the nature of what we're dealing with. RDA needs to be able to be used by original catalogers. There's no question about that. But it also needs to be able, the data elements need to be there so we can ingest data from publishers and still have it be interoperable in our systems. The language has changed to be a little more predictable for computer use. It's not, it's not a narrative. And it requires thinking a little differently than in the past. That's why I did that slide with the breakdown of the definitions. I, yes, I recognize it's not the most cataloger-friendly language, but it's where we are now. And if you find things that are particularly difficult to understand in RDA in the beta toolkit, please use the feedback form and let us know. That would be especially true in guidance chapters. I think we can work on those and help them become a little more clear in terms of language and de the definition and scope. Those are probably more difficult to change, but if you are finding particular challenges with specific things and understanding them, please let us know. We may be able to clarify things for you. Any other questions in the chat? Unmute yourself to ask. Uh, Francoise has one. In the perspective of entity cataloging, RDA choices for describing aggregates that are collections of expressions are very expensive in terms of time of cataloging and new aggregating work, even if there are very small changes in the aggregate manifestation as it occurs in audiovisual material. I understand that perspective. Um, I'm not sure that I agree with it because we have to spend the time figuring things out anyway. As I said earlier, we're cataloging complicated things. Um, how we deal with aggregates has never been easy. Um, and if we actually have a, a DVD with first just the movie, and then it's reissued with a movie and a director's cut and behind the scenes commentary and how we made the models and whatever. That is really a different work. Our users who are interested in that background information that was not on the original release only want that second disc. How do we provide that information to our users to say, oh yes, it's Lord of the Rings with Peter Jackson's commentary and not just a straightforward copy of the theatrical release. These things are complicated. If we hide them in notes or otherwise, then it makes it much harder to find and probably we are preventing people from discovering resources that they are looking for. It Again, it really depends on the resources that we as cataloging institutions want to devote to cataloging. Knowing when good enough is good enough for your community. Um, the aggregates don't have to be described in their full glory of the model, and I think that's an important takeaway. The example you are given is not uh, what I think. It is uh, more for an uh, album from uh, a singer with uh, one or more songs 
depending of the of the carrier that is more uh, that can contain more or less uh, uh, content. So in some cases you can have one or one or more uh, uh, song, but you have the the same images, the same concept from uh, when the elaboration of the uh, of the product and uh, the same also uh, uh, advertising, advertising campaign and so on. And also the, the example that you have given about uh, um, the, the, the aggregates uh, with uh, the traduction in Danish and then uh, with, uh, with uh, the interpretive in uh, print form and then in uh, in the uh, spoken word, I think the selection of the uh, of the poems. Uh, I, if I well record it, is poems or uh, of the of the the constitution of the aggregates is one aggregating work. Yes, it has be, been done once, and after we have some declination uh, in other languages, and in this case. Also, for static works uh, that are not aggregates, we have not, we don't have expression. We have uh, new works. Uh, I think it is not very consistent, and I don't find in LRM where it is written that in each case of aggregates, uh, even static aggregates, uh, we have uh, it. We we have this uh, uh, work expression lock that uh, is for me, an RDA choice is, but it is not in the model. Well, as we've understood aggregates in LRM, it's very clear that the aggregate is the plan, and it is not the outcome of executing the plan. The, the aggregate work is the plan to bring works together. The aggregate expression is the embodiment of that down to the, the manifestation. If it is the plan, then I suppose my plan to publish two works together could be in English, even if what I'm aggregating is in French. But what's important to our users is not that I have a plan in my head that's in English, but that the output is in French. That they don't, and they probably don't care that I came up with the plan. That's really where we come down on the aggregates. Now, in terms of very practical things, um, I think I understood you to give an example of a compilation of songs where maybe one or two songs, other, otherwise they're the same, one or two songs make it different and therefore it's a different aggregating work. Um, the way you can convey that in your cataloging is with a contents note. You don't have to give access points to absolutely every song in the compilation. Um, and it's also going to be up to how much time you ask, again back to how 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 much is good enough? I don't expect catalogers to compare word by word or chapter by chapter to see if something is the same. If it presents itself as being the same aggregate, and then go ahead and say it's the same aggregate. Somebody doing more detailed cataloging might find out that it's not the same. But they're very, sometimes they're very clear labels. Um, I'm a music cataloger, so I know that compact discs are issued with bonus tracks that originally the album did not have. That's a different, that's a different work. Um, how I provide access to that difference um, is going to be up to me and my collection. Maybe I have access points, maybe I just use a contents note. And those things are brought together by the commonalities in the description and how our systems bring that information together to our users. There are a couple of there are a couple of comments in the um, in the chat that I will just direct people to. I won't read them, but just call your attention to that. There's some other comments on in, in this on the chat. Go ahead. All right, well, I will let the um, chat people back and forth um, have their own arguments, because um, I think I've already answered Bernhard's question about the elaborate on something that is conceptually necessary. Um, it's model, 
it's important to follow the model. And what I think was very important for us in the modeling was to understand the complexity of the model and then see how it can be pared down and where shortcuts can be made, as opposed to making some decisions, which I have seen in the past, where, oh, it has to be simple. And so you make a simple model, and then you find the first thing that breaks the model, and then the, the, the mental gymnastics you go through to try to deal with that is quite complicated. Uh, Michael Beer asks, do you think publishers and vendors will apply the RDA rules for aggregates for the metadata they create for libraries? No, no I don't. I don't expect publishers and vendors to use RDA. It would be nice if they did. Um, won't the metadata created by RDA original catalogers and publishers differ more in the future and create problems in our catalogs? We have a broad range of RDA elements. Some are narrower than others. I'm hopeful that some of the metadata we ingest from publishers and other external sources can be mapped to broad elements. And the, the data that we create ourselves can be mapped to more specific elements. Then our system should be able to understand the relationships between those broader and narrower elements and present results to our users that are meaningful. Ben Harn says, to me, it's not about simplicity. It's about obfuscating relevant practical guidance for the sake of consistency. Um, I think this may be addressed by some of the clarifications and community versions and element set excerpts that we hope to be able to develop um, as a display for RDA users. Um, we've talked a long time about being able to have a display of instructions specific to music catalogers or to map catalogers or something like that. If there's a whole set of elements that are not important to you, uh, we should be able to, in the long run, be able to generate a view that is of RDA that is more useful to you individually. Francoise says, if you have to create a new expression record and work record for each version of an aggregate, it takes time. RDA is applicable in current systems. Yes, Francoise, but you do not have to create a new expression record and work record for each version. There are minimum requirements, but you don't have to necessarily create an expression record for an aggregate, as my presentation showed. Yes, it, is it is applicable in current systems, but there is a lot of flexibility in terms of what is minimally required. But if you want to describe correctly the, uh, the aggregate, you, you have to do this. So we know that uh, if you cannot uh, describe any, any uh, uh, music, uh, music, uh, music item, which are all, all are, uh, aggregates, and we, we have to describe the content and uh, to, to make a so we will need this so and, and if we cannot uh, uh, consider that if we have the the same concepts that are realized uh, in different expressions so it, it for us <laughs> in our analysis it it is not uh, it, it is not practical and it will not be applied very simply, and also if we need in, uh, to make uh, this, uh, gen I don't record how, what is the name, but the broader work uh, uh, access point in order to make a link uh, between all these versions, it is uh, it is complicated for catalogers, and it take it will be it will take uh, too much time, I think. So, uh, I really, in current catalog with bibliographic and authority record, it uh, has uh, the information are still mixed in uh, in the bibliographic record. It is applicable, but uh, if you do really entity cataloging, we uh, describing each entity uh, separately with links, it will be. Um, 
too expensive. It would take too much time. So I think there are choices that libraries make. I, you're speaking to me now as a music cataloger, so I can, I definitely feel comfortable saying this. Um, there are some compact discs that I catalog. Um, and again, now Maryland has, the University of Maryland has a piano music archive. So when we have compact discs of piano music, we give access points to every work, every performer, whether it's a large work or a small work, it's important to that collection. But I also catalog things for the general collection where it's a compilation of um, Yo-Yo Ma's favorite pieces, or it's a, a Beatles album. There are all sorts of ways to provide access to the work that don't require creating individual access points for everything. We can use strings instead of things, uh, or things instead of strings. It's, it's a choice. So if I decide that I'm going to convey the contents of my compact disc by making a note, then it's not actionable beyond that. It is a string and not a thing and the entity interaction of that ends there. But the data is the data is still available to my users. We, we are, uh, sorry, but we are a bibliographic agency, so we need to provide, uh, and we have first, French library are reusing our records. So uh, if we don't uh, provide uh, detailed cataloging <laughs> and uh, it, it will not we don't make our uh, task for our community which is a national uh, community and I don't so see don't, I, cannot, I cannot say it is enough for us and uh, and so I, I think it is no more the, the way of reasoning <laughs> Well, I don't, I don't think that either of those examples that I gave you would be considered minimal. They would be, in my mind, considered full-level cataloging and shared at the highest level in OCLC for my records. I might even make them compliant with the Program for Cooperative Cataloging Standards. And I don't see that RDA requires any changes to those approaches and saying that either one is less viable or important or valuable or complete than the other. They are just different choices. They're different choices about whether you make a link, whether you make an access point, or whether you do an a unstructured description, you're still providing the information. And the model itself, does, as I said earlier, does not require everything to be completed um, shortcuts are available and choices are available to you for the best way to convey a particular piece of information and that could change based on the kind of publication you're cataloging. Kathy, I'd also like to add that, that we have used RIMP4 uh, to test some of these things and I can assure you that it does not take any more effort to uh, enter uh, an access point two access points in one entity description or one access point in two entity descriptions. It simply is not true that it's more expensive. RDA is optimized for machine assistance. You know, we are not talking about people sitting on high chairs here with quill pens and catalog cards. And uh, it's very, very easy to scale this up. And this is also the answer to, to Bernard's uh, comment is with the underlying ontology, et cetera, it makes it very, very much easier for systems to assist human catalogers uh, in creating new entity descriptions instead of, for example, as I said, adding a new field to an existing description. So I, I, our tests with RIM have shown no evidence the choosing one method over another, for example, with modeling aggregates, uh, it is any more expensive, obviously. You can record more detail. The more detail you record, the more flexible and reusable your metadata is, but, but that's a, a trivial truism. Uh, if you are preparing highly detailed records as a bibliographic agency, and then I should imagine that you will actually have savings of scale here. 
and uh, and until uh, this sort of thing can be tested uh, in other systems, in Mark systems, for example, um, I think we're speculating. But I can assure you, we've tested this in RIMP. And I certainly found in using RIMPF myself for various Janathons and also with other projects and training, yes, the initial getting used to how to set up data in a new way, not something that's familiar to me, takes time. But once those entity records are there, the linking is really simple and things get moving much more quickly. So yeah, the, the initial work, may be a little more complicated, but just like anything else, when we become familiar with it, um, it moves more more quickly. I am not uh, speaking about entity cataloging as in uh, uh, BNF and uh, also in France in general, we are uh, working on the new system for uh, entity cataloging, really, uh, um, so, uh, and uh, it is uh, the problem is not here. The problem is the choice, uh, and uh, when you create a new a new record, it takes a little more time than when you have only a link to do. I am sorry, but perhaps uh, I am wrong. I hope so, and the, uh, our experience will prove that uh, my concerns are not uh, justified, but uh, for the moment, uh, I think uh, it, for us, it is a concern, really. Okay, I mean, I don't think I have, I think you've heard everything I have to say on that. I don't think I have anything else to add to the discussion. Um, I can see there's also continuing discussion about the complexity of RDA in the chat, which if you are interested in that, I encourage you to read the chat. Is there any additional questions or anything new anyone would like to bring up? Uh, Thurston asks, may the current developments around string encoding schemes lead to the creation of a new working group? Could you give us an update on the progress being made with the addition of new examples to the beta toolkit? Okay, um, I, I think we would be interested in helping support whatever is needed for the continuing development of string encoding schemes. We are not yet at a point that I'm aware of, but Maybe I'm not just paying enough attention that we're ready to do that. But um, if Thurston, if you have particular suggestions or if any of you who are working on that would like to get together and try to figure out things, um, I think we we want this to be successful and we'd like, you know, you guys are on the, on the ground trying to make this work. So we need to have uh, people on the front lines trying to make this work, tell us what, what they need. So I think we'd be open to opening a dialogue about what kind of support you need. Um, update on the progress being made with the addition of new examples to the toolkit. Um, as far as I know, that's ongoing. We do have a new examples editor, and she's continuing to do work. The examples in the beta site right now are not considered to be complete or exhaustive. And I want to dispel the thought that I, I saw um, recently that the new toolkit will have fewer examples than the original. That's not the intention. They will be different examples. Um, right now, yes, they're fewer because they all needed to be reevaluated to make sure that they were still applicable. And um, as you probably know, the examples editors have always worked hard to make sure that we're not just giving you Anglo-American examples. So if there's a need to, ex to identify something new, we may not want to use the existing examples just because there, they might show an Anglo-American bias where that would not be appropriate. And that's a consideration even though the examples are used in the English language toolkit and there's flexibility for the translations to use other examples, we still want to showcase the diversity that is um, the international community using RDA in the, even in the English language toolkit. And Thurston, more, more specifics on that I would have to ask our examples editor. 
um, Ahava uses this opportunity to remind you that URIG is still looking for volunteers for the URIG Examples Working Group. Honor Moody, um, the RSC Examples Editor, is a member of the Working Group, so she will be able to reuse the work that you all do on that. Is it too early to ask what kinds of training programs might be made available? Well, Deanna, this is a really difficult question for the RSC to answer. As I mentioned earlier, what we can do is provide general overviews of what's available in the toolkit, the flexibility, some of the development considerations we've had. When you saw the cataloging examples that, that I put in my presentation today, you heard a lot of caveats about there's no application profile I came up with, I just came up with this on the top of my head. It doesn't answer the real questions that I know most catalogers have is this item just ended up on my desk, I have to catalog it, what RDA instructions am I going to use? The RSC really can't answer those questions because of all of the options that are available to cataloging communities, things rec anywhere from which elements do I use to what recording method do I use. So the training really needs to be at the community level with the application profiles in place to have any significant, and, and policy statements, to have any real significant meaning. Training you can have right now, um, you'll get a lot of caveats about will work with me, or my assumption is blah, blah, blah. Uh, there is an RDA lab series coming up, um, in, I think it's starting in June, uh, Jamie can correct me if I'm wrong, um, taught by Kate James, it's going to run for 24 sessions and that's available through ALA Publishing. And that will be more practical, but I also understand that Kate will be saying, we are assuming that the elements I'm using are out of this community and for these reasons. So please stay tuned, look for um, things that ALA Publishing is offering, but also what, um, for those of you who have specific communities, what your communities might be willing to offer. So I can always provide some sort of broader context, but like I said, the practical is very difficult because you have to make assumptions. Um, I'll just add that, this is Jamie, um, I'll just add that um, we are in very, very, very early consideration of extending the RDA lab series to um, running it in um, January 2021, starting in January 2021 at a time that's more friendly for um, uh, you folks in Europe. And, um, and I have to discuss this with Kate though, I haven't done that yet. So this is just a concept we're considering. Uh, she's open to it, and maybe if we do that, she can tweak her um, the assumptions in her presentation, so they're maybe a little more um, reflective of European practices. But uh, you know, it's tricky because it's uh, so several people have already stated you're a very um, heterogeneous community, so um, you know, trying to kind of come up with a generic uh, uh, European institution may not um, be quite so easy. So I see Bernard notes in the comments that he believes that my statement that the RSC can't provide the training is it means that we're outsourcing the training to the communities. Yes, um, that's, I don't think we ever did practical training at the international level because I can't tell you and in the original toolkit as it was first published whether you had to use latest title entry or first title entry for series serials. So I, you know, there was no international agreement on that. And if you got the training from Americans, you would get one answer. And if you got training from the German community, you would get another answer. It is up to the communities to determine how to use RDA. We could just give you training and says you're supposed to use linked data and take everything else out. That's not useful. What your community practices are, whether it's governed by your national library or URIG as a whole, or a collaborative of national libraries, or in, the, in North America, the Library of Congress cooperating with the program for cooperative cataloging. That's where the nitty gritty things are, and that's where they are right now. The training that I need to have as a music cataloger in North America is RDA itself, LCPCC policy statements, and Music Library Association best practices. And as a music cataloger, the best training I'm going to get is from the Music Library Association. 
And Bernard says, to clarify, not so much training, but the narrative that I mentioned before. I don't know quite how to answer that, but I just acknowledge that, yes, we hear this concern that there's an outsourcing to the communities, but we think that that's what is required for an international standard that intentionally embraces flexibility. Deanna says, I would think even how to navigate through the RDA toolkit type training would be useful. That is, there is some of that available um, on the RSC's website right now. The presentations that were made at ALA Midwinter in January 2020, um, I believe, are all available on the RSC website under presentations or documents, anyway. Um, probably both. Yes, and let's, Casey, let's, the videos from uh, Kate James on uh, YouTube, they are free accessible and they are such things. They are providing such things as Diana meet, uh, meant. Thank you, Renata. That's true. I keep forgetting. There's, there's, so there's free training I, on the RDA Toolkit's um, YouTube site. Yes, when, when you type in a search machine on um, Kate James, RDA, train or something, then they are coming. And they are short and such thing as you mentioned, Dayan, RDA for, for dummies or use of the toolkit or something like this. I sent up uh, the link and now, uh, merci Daniel, he sent the link as well. Yes, thank you very much for both of you. Um, the YouTube site will contain full presentations and if URIG were not putting this one up and we decided it should be on the YouTube site, something like this could be on the YouTube site, but also Kate is doing much shorter presentations that are very quick, sort of, what, about 10 minutes on how to do something. Um, we do make the majority of our presentations available on the RSC website under the presentations uh, menu, and there's a wide variety of things that we make freely available to all of you. Um, I'll, I'll, this is Jamie again. I'll also um, be doing occasional um, demos of the toolkit, um, live demos um, to walk you through all the ins and outs of the toolkit. Um, and I'll make those available. Um, afterwards, I'll record them and make them available um, on the YouTube site as well. And there is a link if you go to rdatoolkit.org, there is a link at the very top right. Um, you'll see a little YouTube icon that'll take you right to the YouTube channel. Okay, so if there are no other questions, I will ask you all to turn on your cameras and I will take the group photo of all the people who have uh, soldiered on to the end. Thurston is saying the webcam limit has been reached. Hmm? Thurston says we now have the maximum number of webcams up. Oh, well, I've been taking a few, taking different pictures, so hopefully I will get everyone and I can always try to uh, merge different pictures. I guess somebody's just dropped off because I've just appeared. <laughs> okay, let me try again one more. Okay. 
Okay, I got a lot, I grabbed a lot of different pictures. I will try to Photoshop everyone whose pictures showed up into the correct boxes and all the different pictures. Kathy, thank you very much for agreeing to uh, undergo, to, to listen to all of our questions and concerns. Well, it's a and, pleasure, and, pleasure meeting with all of you, and I'm sorry I couldn't do it in person. <laughs> well, hopefully some other year we will. This is your second presentation it's a, at a EURIG event that's had to be online. So hopefully one of these days we'll actually be able to uh, see you to something in exchange for having some nice uh, alcohol or something. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I can't I can't get started with afternoon um, libations yet. <laughs> See, that's why you have to be in Europe. It's already evening here. Exactly. Okay, and thank you all uh, for having uh, attended your thank, thank you. Thank you, Ahava uh, and Kathy. I just want to uh, thank you both. And uh, uh, I want to, to tell you that we were uh, so happy that this year we will having uh, RDA, part of the RDA steering committee, of course, in Jerusalem and then in Egypt. Uh, but our invitation is extended till next year. So uh, if you are still <laughs> intended to do it, we would be so happy to have you all in Egypt next year. Thank you, Rania. The RSC has not made a final decision about meeting in Jerusalem, but I'm not holding my breath either this year for obvious reasons. That's okay. Thank you. Yeah, we will work if you know, the RSC is interested. We will work with Egypt to find mutually convenient times that you can hit both countries. Like Rania, we would love to have you if it doesn't work out this year. We want you some other year. Of course. Thank you again. You're welcome. And once again, thank you all for having made this virtual meeting a success. I think it really, if we couldn't meet together, it worked that well. We covered a lot of ground. We had great people coming and, and helping us understand what we're facing. And thank you all. Hopefully next year we'll get to meet in person. Thank you, Ahava. And Hannah and Jenny. All doing the work behind.